I'd say stop thinking so much. That's what I would say. I feel like the world thinks too much. I feel like if they just spent more time living and just not thinking. But that's me, you know. I, I don't think ever, and, and I seem to be doing okay. I'm a happy guy. You know, some people just need to stop thinking about everything they do and just do it. But who wants to take advice from a 19-year-old kid? Malcolm McCormick was born January 19, 1992 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. In a family of four, his mom Karen is a photographer and his dad Mark is an architect. And he has one older brother, Miller. Malcolm and his brother were raised in a Jewish household in the neighborhood of Point Breeze. Growing up, he would attend a Catholic grade school because his parents believed it would ensure a better education and the chance to play football and lacrosse when he was older. But Malcolm was never a school-oriented person. He spent a lot of his time listening to music like the Beastie Boys, Sugar Hill Gang, and Bob Marley. By the time he was in middle school, he had already taught himself the piano, guitar, drums, and bass. At the time, he didn't know these influences would play a major role in his life later down the road. In middle school, he started to adopt the idea of creating his own music or becoming a songwriter, initially having dreams of being a singer. But according to him, when people heard him sing, people were hating on his voice, so over time, that dream started to fade. By the time Malcolm was attending Tater Alders High School, he had already become familiar with smoking weed and stopped playing sports altogether. One day he was in a friend's attic smoking weed and playing old school beats after school. They started freestyling for fun, and to his surprise he was really good at it, and before they knew it, hours had gone by. This started to become a regular thing, where they would hang out, smoke, and freestyle. Finally, one of Malcolm's friends told him he should start recording these songs. His friend grabbed a microphone and old computer out of his basement and encouraged him to start recording a full song, and he stated he fell in love with the entire process. After enjoying it so much, it got him thinking that maybe he could really take this seriously and do something with it. He was interested in making a mixtape, but was unsure about the whole process, so he just started recording anything and everything he could, writing what he says was a ridiculous amount of raps. At the time, he didn't have the luxury of going online and buying beats, so he would record a DJ Premiere and Alchemist beats. It didn't take long for the idea to really take over in his head. He got to the point where music was all he was really thinking about, during school and in his free time. Before he knew it, he already had recorded enough music for a full-length mixtape. In 2007, he released his first project, titled But My Mac and Ain't Easy, under the moniker Easy Mac. Mac says he tried to be very experimental with his music, and he was still trying to find his avenue. He enjoyed blending genres like indie rock and rap. After the release of his first project, he really started to hustle, and if he did end up going to school, it was often just to pass out his mixtapes, and he was hardly seen in class. He says he was known as the class clown and was never a shy person. He hung out with a lot of different types of people. He says his mindset in high school was simply to enjoy himself, and he viewed it as an experience. As his music began to progress, he started making a small name for himself in his high school, and slowly outside the whole city of Pittsburgh. The rap scene in Pittsburgh at the time was deeper than it seemed on the outside, and was actually pretty big. Max says it may not have been like New York or Atlanta, but rather super local, which meant once people started to hear about you, it really gives you a platform to start with. This gave Mac the opportunity to work with other local artists like BD, where they dropped their How High tape under the duo The Ill Spoken. Although he was getting his name out there and forming a small fan base, he was still just in high school and it was often hard to come up with money for studio time. This led to Mac, along with his friends Jimmy and Trees, to steal TVs during house parties and resell them. He also used to sell weed where he says he ripped off his clients by selling them shitty weed while promising it was high grade. But he would always blow his re-up money on studio time anyways. By 2009, he settled on the name Mac Miller and released another mixtape titled The Jukebox. The intro of the mixtape starts with the voiceover of Mac giving his fans a message. Hey yo, what's up y'all? It's the kid Mac Miller, that high school rapper y'all love. I just wanna tell everybody this. This hip hop shit right here, I live it. 100% point blank motherfucking period. I ain't got no other options. I ain't got no backup plan. This is it for me. This tape is important in a lot of ways, but mainly for showcasing Mac's potential. From the cover art to the music itself, if you heard it, you'd probably be a fan of the high schooler after. After releasing this tape, Mac started reaching out to other local artists and producers. One of the producers Mac reached out to over MySpace was Big Germ, who was working out at ID Labs Studios in Pittsburgh. Mac started recording at ID Labs often with Big Germ, and it gave him an opportunity to really develop as an artist, as well as network. One day Mac went to ID Labs to record when he ran into another local artist named Wiz Khalifa. At the time, much like Mac, Wiz Khalifa was starting to make a name for himself in the city. The two who had already known each other through music, as well as the fact that they went to the same high school, hit it off and collabed on some music. He would also meet Benji, who was the president of Rostrum Records, which his friend Wiz Khalifa was signed to already. Benji would often give Mac advice about the industry, but seemed to have no interest in signing him at the time. 
On December 16, 2009, Mac Miller dropped his third official mixtape, The High Life, which featured Wiz Khalifa and was solely produced by Mac, Germ, and the Most Dope crew. The tape helped bring an even bigger buzz to Mac's fan base that was starting to grow large even outside of his city now. When he got to the studio in early 2010 and started working on his new tape Kids, Benji from Rostrum started to notice how talented Mac really was. He said he noticed a maturing not only in his sound but the way he approached his music as well. Benji then offered to sign Mac to Rostrum Records in July of 2010, but at this point Mac had already been receiving offers from other record companies, but he ended up choosing Rostrum due to its location in his hometown and its association with his friend Wiz Khalifa. Um, follow your dreams. Yeah. yeah. That month, he dropped the music video for his first single off his upcoming tape. The song was Kool Aid and Frozen Pizza, and shortly after, Nike's On My Feet. Both songs did very well, gaining millions of plays, and blogs started tuning in, writing reviews about the upcoming rapper. Although Mac was still a senior in high school, he was already living in his own apartment with the money he was now making off music and his signing to Rostrum. Things were starting to look up for him. But it wasn't until August of 2010 where Mac would receive nationwide exposure for his mixtape Kids. The mixtape was a reference to the 1995 movie and stood for kicking incredibly dope shit. The tape was well received by fans and put Mac's name in front of millions of new people, jump starting his career and landing him his first tour, the Incredibly Dope Tour, which sold out every show. With all eyes on Mac, he released two more mixtapes in 2011, Best Day Ever and I Love Life Thank You, earning him his well-deserved spot on the 2011 XXL Freshman cover. At this point, Mac Miller was becoming a household name and he had done it with little radio play, making his debut album that much more anticipated. Blue Side Park, the album was released November 8, 2011, and it debuted at number one on the Billboard, selling 144,000 copies its first week. Even though the album was a massive success, music critics seemed to be extra critical toward Mac, stating he still needed room to grow, and he hasn't found his sound yet. The criticism didn't hold him back though, and he was gaining more popularity daily. But popularity and fame can also come with unwanted stresses. For Mac, this came in 2012 after the release of Macadelic, and he was non-stop touring. And the itch to tell people, don't worry, I'm okay. Don't worry, I'm okay. People that care about me and, and fans that, that love my music, and it's a beautiful, a beautiful relationship with them. To manage the stress of the tour, he began taking promethazine and later became dependent on it. Although he managed to quit before filming his reality show, Mac Miller and the Most Dope Family, this was spring an on and off relationship with various drugs throughout the years. For many fans, this didn't come as a secret, as he was pretty open with his drug use and depression in his music. In 2014, his last and final mixtape, Faces, displayed many examples of this. Mac went public stating he was taking drugs daily, and he even felt like the final track on the tape, titled Grand Finale, was intended to be his last song made on Earth. Just a year later, he was seemingly healthier after releasing the Good AM album, this time receiving overwhelming positive reviews from critics stating his art had grown immensely over the years. Mac reflected back, saying he was in a better headspace for this project. He was learning to live a little, whereas a year before he was super depressed and was isolating himself. This back and forth battle of emotion would continue to haunt him over the years, living in a loop of sobriety and dependence. In 2016, he released his fourth album, The Divine Feminine. It debuted at number two on Billboard 100 and number one on the R&B charts. The tape demonstrated Mac singing alongside rap and incorporated genres like jazz and funk, proving he was capable of mastering multiple Multiple genres. Unfortunately, he was still suffering from depression and drug use though. In 2016, he told The Fader he'd rather be a corny white rapper than a drugged out mess who can't get out of the house, but he hates being sober also. In 2017, things were pretty quiet for Mac on the music side, and there was no new releases. But this was okay because he seemed to be in good spirits again, and spent the year with his girlfriend of the time, Ariana Grande, and he was taking a break from social media. This would continue into 2018 until the two decided to go separate ways. Just weeks later, he crashed his car in the San Fernando Valley and was arrested for a DUI, sparking concern from his fans that he may not have been doing okay. He went public in multiple interviews stating he had made a mistake and that he was fine. On August 3rd, 2018, he released his Swimming's album, and it gave Mac Miller his fifth consecutive top five album. For me, it's being able to touch and affect people in a positive way and have music that, that lasts for a long time, have a long career, and um, being able to be influential in, in a positive way. Pittsburgh rapper Mac Miller is dead at age 26. Mac Miller has died of an apparent drug overdose. Ms. Malcolm James McCormick, age 26, died of an apparent overdose. An apparent overdose. Apparent overdose. Apparent drug overdose. Overdose pronounced dead. Tragically, just a month later, Malcolm was found unresponsive in his Studio City home. 
he was just about to embark on the swimming tour. It's impossible to know where Mac Miller's ever-evolving sound would have gone next. His career displayed a long progression of talent with continuous improvement and building of his artistry. Mac Miller leaves behind a legacy of growth of someone striving for self-improvement. His art will live forever.